All right. <clears throat> We're continuing our series of sermons in the book of Genesis. And, and we come to the history of Joseph tonight, which is where the, the Genesis narrative takes kind of an unexpected, somewhat disconcerting turn. Up to this point, we've seen some characters go through some difficult times. But you really can't say that they didn't earn every minute of it. In fact, you could say that they got off easier than they deserved. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all three made some boneheaded, stubborn, and rebellious moves. And, and, and while they each paid a bit of a price for it, you can also see how that, at least for them at least, the bread kept landing butter side up, if you will. God was patient with each of them again and again and again until they finally came around and got serious about living according to God's commands and trusting in His promises. And now we get to Joseph. If you're keeping score at all, Joseph is better than the other leading characters in Genesis. He has more character. He has more resolve, more faithfulness, more integrity than all the others. In fact, you can only fault Joseph for one thing, and it's fairly small. We're going to get to that here in just a few minutes. In last week's message, the story ended with Jacob returning to the land of Canaan, the home of his father Isaac and his grandfather Abraham. He made peace with his brother Esau, and then he built an altar to worship the God who had been with him all the way. Shortly after this, his wife, Rebekah, gave birth to Benjamin, Jacob's twelfth son. It was a hard labor for Rebekah, and she didn't survive. As you may remember, she was Jacob's favorite wife. So Jacob built a stone monument in her memory. Jacob had a tendency to play favorites with his sons, and Joseph who was a teenager by now, was his chosen favorite. Look at Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37, verses 3 and 4. It says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons, because Joseph was a son born to him in his old age, and he made a robe of many colors for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not bring themselves to speak peaceably to him. And then Joseph had a dream one night. Dreams play a very big role in Joseph's life. And when he told his brothers the dream, they despised him even more. This is what he told them about his dream. Look in verse 7 here in Genesis 37. There we were, binding sheaves of grain in the field. Suddenly, my sheaf stood up, and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. And so his brothers asked, What are you trying to tell us? Are you actually trying to tell us that you're going to be our ruler? Look in verse 9. Then he had another dream and told it to his brothers. Look, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun, moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. And he also told his father, Jacob, about this dream. And Jacob said to him, Are you saying that your mother and your brothers and I are all going to bow before you? And his brothers hated him even more. But Jacob just wondered what the dream could possibly mean. Now, I said that Joseph didn't really do anything wrong. But this was his one mistake, in my opinion. He probably should have kept his dreams to himself. Could have very easily done that. 
I don't believe, my own personal opinion, I don't believe that he was being antagonistic towards his brothers, okay? By telling them that basically they were going to be his servants. Now, by way of a spoiler alert, his dream actually does happen several years down the road. Finally, Joseph's brothers decided that they had had enough of Joseph. Not only did he tell them his dreams, but he had a habit of reporting back to Jacob whenever any of them did something wrong. Kind of like me when I was growing up. I was the youngest. I was, I was the tattletale. I told my mother everything that my two older brothers did. That's just what the baby of the family is supposed to do. Okay? <clears throat> anyway, they decided that they'd had enough and that they simply wanted him gone. They were going to kill him. Now, now, this is hard to imagine, but it's a recurring theme in the book of Genesis. Brothers are seeking to kill brothers. It happened with Cain and Abel. Esau wanted to kill Jacob. And now several of Jacob's sons were ready to take Joseph's life. Their plan was to kill him, throw him into a deep water tank, and tell Jacob that he was attacked by wild animals. And they said, you know, if we do this, this is going to put an end to his dreams. However, his brother Reuben came to his defense, sort of. He said, you know, we don't actually need to kill him. Let's just throw him in an empty water tank, and in time, he's just going to die on his own. Now, Reuben said this because he was planning to come back later and rescue him. So the brothers took Joseph's fancy robe. Apparently, he wore this technicolor dream coat everywhere. And they tossed him in an empty well. And about this time, there was a caravan of slave traders that were coming by. And, and, and Judah, one of his brothers, came up with this brilliant idea. He said, you know, instead of just leaving him here, instead of hurting him, let's sell him to these Ishmaelites. Now, you remember who Ishmael was, right? That was Isaac's half-brother. These were his descendants. So the brothers pulled Joseph out of the well, and they said to him, in effect, Good news, brother. We're not going to leave you here to die. Instead, we're going to sell you to these guys. You now belong to them. So the brothers sold Joseph for 20 shekels of silver. And then they poured goat blood on his coat. And they took it home to Jacob, telling him that Joseph had gotten attacked and didn't survive. And Jacob was inconsolable. Meanwhile, the Ishmaelites took Joseph to Egypt, where he was sold to a high-ranking government official named Potiphar. Joseph worked in Potiphar's household, and look in chapter 39, Genesis chapter 39, verses 2 through 5. It says, The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, serving in the household of his Egyptian master. And when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made everything he did successful, Joseph found favor in his master's sight and became his personal attendant. Potiphar also put him in charge of his household and placed all that he owned under his authority. The Bible says that Potiphar didn't have to worry about anything except what to eat. That was it. Unfortunately, there was something else that Potiphar needed to worry about. Look at verses, the end of verse 6 through 9 here in chapter 39. It says, Now Joseph was well built and handsome. After some time, his master's wife looked longingly at Joseph and said, Sleep with me. But he refused. Look, he said to his master's wife, 
With me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in his house. And he has put all that he owns under my authority. No one in this house is greater than I am. He has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. So how could I do such a great evil and sin against God? Mrs. Potiphar didn't want to take no for an answer. She tried again and again. And Joseph did everything that he could to try to avoid her. But she just wouldn't give up. So one day she grabbed him. He tore himself away from her and ran from the house. But in the process, a torn piece of his cloak was left behind. Later, when her husband came home, look what happened. Look at verse 17, starting in verse 17. It says, Then she told him the same story. The Hebrew slave you brought to us came to make a fool of me. But when I screamed for help, he left his garment with me and ran outside. Well, quite naturally, Potiphar was upset. He was enraged. He wasted no time in throwing Joseph into prison where all the king's prisoners were held. Once again, through no fault of his own, Joseph was on the receiving end of the most inhumane treatment imaginable. He was tossed aside by his brothers, sold as a slave, and here he's wrongly accused of one of the worst kinds of wrongdoing that there was. He didn't deserve it. But still the prison doors clanged shut behind him. And there he was. And there he was meant to be for the rest of his life. Now, the story doesn't end there. And I'm sure most of you are already aware of what happens. But for us today, for right now, this is just about where the story is going to end. Because I want you to feel, for just a moment, Joseph's pain. The injustice towards him. The betrayal. And the certainty that, that he had to have felt totally abandoned. This isn't where the story ends. But I don't know that Joseph didn't know that. Maybe Joseph thought that this was the final chapter of his brief life story. Naturally, we want to live in a world where good things happen to good people. And we can even accept that sometimes good things might happen to bad people. But why would such a terrible thing happen to somebody who was so good. It isn't right. Where was God? Why did he let it happen? And why didn't he stop it? As much as I'd like to be able to answer those questions, I can't. I don't think anybody can. We live in a fallen world where sin has a stronghold in the hearts of a whole lot of folks. And sometimes injustice reigns, at least for a little while. The Bible promises that there will come a day when all wrongs are made right and justice will rule. In some situations, we're able to see justice served here and now with our own eyes. Other times, we're left waiting until that day when God sets everything right. As Joseph languished in prison, I personally don't believe that he knew for sure how the events of his life were going to play out. But I do believe that Joseph found strength in his most fundamental beliefs about what it means to walk with God. So tonight, in the time that we have remaining, I want to take a look at what I think 
are the three fundamental beliefs that sustained Joseph through perhaps some of the most difficult days of his life. So here are the three fundamental beliefs. First off, it's better to pay the price for doing good than be rewarded for doing wrong. It's better to be punished for good behavior than to be praised for bad behavior. All you have to do is watch the news for about 15 minutes or so and you'll see that the culture that we live in today often confuses those two values. If Joseph had been willing to do what was wrong, he would have earned the favor of a very powerful woman. Perhaps it could have helped his career even more in one way or another. But he refused to play that game. He refused to take that risk. The result was that Joseph paid the price for doing good. And here's the catch. He paid the same price so that many who seek to do good have paid. He was wrongly accused. When the enemy targets believers with the intention of taking them down, the enemy's strategy is not, let's accuse this person of being good. Or, or let's accuse this person of being righteous. That's not the way the enemy's strategy works. The enemy's strategy is, how can I discredit this person? How can I distort the truth towards this person? How can I fabricate details to destroy their reputation? Wrongful accusation is the lifeblood of any oppressive movement because it keeps you living in fear. What if the mob comes after me? That's why Jesus encourages us to remember in Matthew 5, verses 11 and 12, you are blessed when they insult and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Watchman Nee, I mentioned last week, he was one of the greatest Christian leaders in the 20th century. From the 1920s to the 1950s, he traveled all throughout China, winning converts to Christ, discipling new believers and planting churches in China. And then he fell into disfavor with the Communist Party. And they came for him. He was arrested for not for being like Jesus. He wasn't arrested for helping people like many Christian workers in China back then and since then. He was charged with a number of unlikely crimes. Bribery, tax evasion, theft of government information. He was sent to prison where he spent the final 20 years of his life. The perspective of history allows us to see through the deceitful actions of the Chinese Communist Party. But today there are still many who are falsely accused. And they are never vindicated. Joseph could have died in prison with everyone thinking that he was guilty of the worst kind of assault possible. But he would rather pay the price for doing what was right than be rewarded for doing what was wrong. This is one of the reasons that his story is still told today. And here's the second fundamental belief that sustained Joseph through his most difficult days. Even when a situation seems out of control, God still controls the current. 
Sometimes God will say, in effect, I want you to pack your bags and go to this new place. That's what he did with Abraham. And, and, and sometimes God will allow the circumstances of a situation to move you where you need to be. There were reasons why Joseph needed to be in Egypt. It had to do with a worldwide famine that we're going to be looking at next week. And God used all of these circumstances to lead Joseph to where he needed to be. Now to be clear, God didn't create the crisis in Joseph's life. When Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, and when Potiphar's wife falsely accused him of, of trying to rape her, God's response to them was not, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He was in no way pleased with those people. God didn't create the crisis in Joseph's life, but he was able to control it and to use it. It's the same for us. You may have been victimized at some point in your life, wrongly accused, taken advantage of, cheated, bullied, fired without cause, and on and on. I want you to know that God didn't create whatever crisis you faced or may now be facing. He didn't create it, but He can control it. He didn't cause the situation, but He can redeem it. There's a verse that I'm sure you all know by heart. It's Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good, for good for those who love God, those who are called according to His purpose. If circumstances are against you, don't give in to the temptation to shake your fist and blame God for everything that you don't like about your life. Because he didn't do it. But he can make it right. He can control the situation and he can redeem your suffering. As Joseph languished in prison, not sure of what might happen next, he knew that God wasn't to blame. And even though the situation seemed out of control, I believe that he knew that God still controlled the current of what was going on. And there's a third fundamental belief, I believe, that sustained Joseph through his most difficult days. No amount of injustice can separate you from God's favor. As I said a few minutes ago, that, that this is just about where the story ends with the clanging of the dungeon doors and Joseph facing the rest of his life in a musty underground cell. That's almost where today's story ends, but not quite. Here Joseph was in the worst imaginable situation. But look what happened. Look in Genesis 39 verses 21 through 23. It says, But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. He granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. The warden put all the prisoners who were in the prison under Joseph's authority, and he was responsible for everything that was done there. The warden did not bother with anything under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And the Lord made everything that he did successful. You've heard of people who can't win for losing? You've heard that phrase before? Every break they get somehow goes bad. Joseph is just the opposite. He can't lose for winning. A situation goes bad and somehow he still manages to rise to the top. Actually, the somehow probably isn't real accurate. It's clear why this keeps happening. It's because God 
is with Joseph every step of the way. And Joseph is with God. He remains faithful no matter what comes his way. Joseph is faithful when his father honors him with a brightly colored robe. He's faithful when he's sold into slavery and loaded in a caravan driven by the Ishmaelites headed to Egypt. He's faithful when he becomes the top administrator of Potiphar's entire household. He's faithful when he's unjustly accused by, by a vindictive woman and thrown into a prison cell. At any point, he could have compromised his principles, abandoned his most cherished beliefs, and succumbed to the evil intentions of others. But he remained faithful. So that even in prison, where he was supposed to be for the rest of his life, he experienced God's favor. And God anointed his work there. There is no dark that is too dark for the light of God to find you. There is no mistreatment that you can endure, no injustice that can come your way that will separate you from God's favor. Wherever you are today, God's favor can find you and He can bless you in the middle of the most unseemly situation. Joseph built his life on these three fundamental beliefs. And these beliefs sustained him through every difficult circumstance that came his way. Each belief relied on the other. Joseph was able to experience the favor of God in a prison cell because he had long since decided that being thrown in prison for doing good was better than being rewarded for doing wrong. If doing right meant paying the price, so be it. He'd rather be right with God. And that's because he knew that God was the one who controlled the currents of life. The enemy may create one crisis after another, and situations may appear to be spinning into chaos, but God still controls the current. He didn't create the crisis that you face, but He has the power to redeem it. So we need to stay faithful to Him. And while God is at work redeeming your situation as only He can, you can be sure that His favor will be with you. He will bless you where you are, even if it's in the middle of a mess. Life, even at its worst, can never separate us from God's favor. Take out your prayer sheets. Could I have a little bit you certainly can.